This is the only advice you need with business success speaker, Matt Hyams. This week, we're talking about how to motivate your employees and relate to them. We're going to talk about zombies, starting a hospice center at your office, and child trafficking rings. All right, let's do this. How do you motivate employees? Well, first, you got to get to know them. That's the first thing, which begs the question, how do you get to know someone? Well, you can start by saying, hey, who are you? But it doesn't stop there. It's hard to really know someone in the office because people act differently in the office and out of the office. So the key for the leader is to get your people out of the office to find out who they really are. Invite them out for drinks and don't let them get out of it because their first reaction is going to be, I don't want to go out for drinks with my boss. I don't want to let my boss into my life because once they know who I am, they can exploit me. And to that, I say, well, a little exploitation never hurt anyone. Some of my best experiences were not only exploiting others, but being exploited myself. That's how I met my first wife and children. I was involved in a child trafficking ring. That's how I met my children. Not a sex trafficking ring. No, no sex. It was literally about traffic. It's a literal interpretation that we used. We would steal children just to clear up traffic jams. We would send these kids out into the street during a traffic jam and people would start to be like, ah, we got to put our traffic jam aside and help these children because they're running around quite crazy, to be honest with you. And so people would find a place to park and they'd get out of their car, at which point the roads would clear up, which was the signal for the kids to run away immediately from the adults trying to help them. And then I could proceed or my team could proceed through the traffic and get to where we were going because it got a little bit tiring. I got tired of being late for meetings because of traffic. So I started this child trafficking ring. And if you're wondering what would happen to those children after they ran away in the traffic jams, well, what would happen is that they'd come back to us because we had told them that bad things would happen if they didn't. And when I say I met my children this way, quote unquote, what I mean is this was a harem of children. These weren't, weren't my biological children. These children were loaned to me for this trafficking scam by a man who has no face. Now, I'm technically on the payroll still, but I don't do this line of work anymore. I eventually felt like it wasn't right to clear up traffic in this way and manipulate people into thinking these kids were in trouble, which they were. But I just felt like the traffic problem could be solved in other ways. So I felt bad about manipulating the adults in that traffic jam. So I don't do that line of work anymore. And those kids are all grown up now, and they're doing great from what I hear. Most of them anyway. Some of them not. But that's another story, and that's not about leadership. So the thing is, when you want to motivate employees, find out who they are. So if you're the leader in the company, you might feel ambivalence on their side about getting together with you after work, about that exploitation issue, about finding out who they are. So you got to put them at ease. Whatever excuse they give you, call them on their bluff. A common excuse is, I can't go out for drinks with you because uh, my father's dying. (laughs) Oh, really? Can't tell you how many times I tried to go out with an employee just to hear that their father was dying. So call them on their bluff, okay? You can say, oh, oh, your father's dying. All right, well, then I'll go to the hospital with you and then find out suddenly how their father's not dying. Now, however, cautionary tale. I did call someone on their bluff uh, when they told me their father was dying, but it turned out to be true. Their father was, in fact, dying. And I ended up having to go to the hospital with this woman so she could say goodbye to her father. And I said goodbye too, even though it was the first time I ever met him. It was sort of a hello, goodbye. Hello, nice to meet you, and goodbye, because he died then and there. But it wasn't all for naught, because this gave me one of my best ideas. I implemented bring your dying parent to work. Some offices have daycares, but at this office, we had a hospice center so people could bring their dying parent to work, which made them feel less guilty about not being there with them. And then they didn't have to use that excuse anymore. And employees found that very motivating. Like, okay, this business cares about me. I can go get a tuna fish sandwich for lunch and I can come back and say goodbye to my mother forever. We even had a cremation plant on site, one and done. You could go have a meeting, get the tuna fish sandwich for lunch, come back, say goodbye to your parent, We burn them. We take care of the ashes. Where do you want them spread? We spread them. It's not even three o'clock and you still got half the workday left to do some of your best work. That's motivation, people. That increased productivity too. So that's one way to motivate your employees. Another way is to simply tell people, hey, you know what? We couldn't do this without you. 
Let them know that they matter, that they play a crucial role in the overall system of things. Now, you might get some pushback if they're already disgruntled because you haven't motivated them ever before. For instance, one time I told an employee, I just want you to know we couldn't do this without you. And he said back to me, do what? You couldn't do what without me? And I said, we couldn't run this company without you. And he said, what are you talking about? What's the company? Now, I felt like he was being ungrateful. And here I am trying to motivate him and I'm getting a lot of attitude. So I said, who hired you? And he said, what are you talking about? Who hired me? Kept doing those quote symbols. And I said, what are you trying to do here exactly? And he said, what do you mean, what are you trying to do here? Again, with the quotes, what is here and who is you? I couldn't take it anymore. I said, why are you asking so many questions and what is your job? And he said to me, my job, get this, is to figure out who is a who and what is a what and how is a how. (laughs) And I'll tell you right now, that is not a job we hired anyone to do. So he was making up his own job description, which wasn't allowed. That's against company policy. And I had had it. I couldn't take this guy for one more second. I was about to call human resources to have them fire him. When I looked in the mirror and it turns out I was talking to myself, I was hallucinating because that was part of my motivational technique at the time. It was for everyone in the office to take ayahuasca together. We used a Native American shaman, which also checked the diversity box two in one. Now, those were some interesting times. There were some spiritual animals involved, some eagles, wolves, snakes, that kind of thing. That was one way we all came together as one. And as far as motivating employees, well, we were all filled with motivation up to our eyeballs, which was also part of the hallucination. Now, that ended when the ayahuasca ran out. So the lesson I learned was to keep a Native American shaman on the payroll so you can keep the ayahuasca flowing. But we ran out of money and a couple people went crazy and never came back to this world. So we had to move on and that business ended up folding. And I don't know what happened to the shaman. People want to come to work and feel like what they're doing matters. That's how you motivate, by creating meaning and purpose, showing them that what they do matters. From the janitor to the CFO. And to prove that point, I would even be the janitor sometimes for a week to show that I wasn't above a little dirty work. Switch it up. Get everyone to experience what it's like to be in each other's shoes. And when I was the janitor, I had to promote the real janitor to CFO. Now, that janitor turned out not to be the greatest CFO. The janitor said to me, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm looking at. And I said, look, just do your best. And he did. And it wasn't very good. And that's a lesson I learned, how to motivate yourself by not making your janitor your CFO. But getting back to motivation, whenever you see people in the office, let them know you know what they do, that they're not invisible to you, that you're aware of their existence. Just a simple nod to someone's existence can go a long way. If you're passing the reception area, tell the receptionist, you are the receptionist. You take calls. Those calls go to other people who work here. And then they'll feel like, I fit here. People know who I am and what I do. Motivating your people also comes down to how you're relating to them. You can do all the pizza parties you want, but if they feel like you're not relatable, it won't matter whether you buy a pepperoni pizza or bring in Dunkin' Donuts munchkins. Which, on a side note, I do recommend bringing in Dunkin' Donuts munchkins because nobody can resist a munchkin. So for older generations, this matters most. This is a bit harder because there's such a huge gap between the oldest generation, the boomers, and the youngest, the Gen Zs. And Gen Zs will not put up with anything less than perfect in their eyes. A new stat came out recently that 150% of Gen Z will hop, will job hop in their first week of their business, even if it's their own business. So if you're a boomer, you're going to have to figure out a way to relate to them or they're going to leave. Now, your biggest obstacle as a boomer or Gen Xer is convincing your Gen Zs that you're not dead because you're so old looking to them that when they look at you, they're going to assume a dead zombie is looking at them and that will neither motivate or be relatable for them. So what you need to do is approach them slowly. No fast movements. Don't rush in quickly because they've seen a lot of zombie movies. They've seen the ones where they move slowly and they've seen the ones that run really fast at them like 28 days later. And if you move too fast, they'll mistake you for a fast moving zombie and be prepared to get a knife in the head. I can't tell you how many older boomer CEOs have been stabbed in the head because the younger generations immediately thought this person was dead and was coming to eat them. So... The question is, how do you convince them you're not a dead zombie brain eater who's coming to eat their brains? Well, go slow. Don't move your arms. Stand still. Say calmly, hello, 
I am a real alive person. I know I look like I'm dead to you, but I'm not dead. I'm actually alive. I'm a real person. I have a family. I have kids, just like one you came from. And I would like to talk to you. And slowly, the mask of your dead, gross face will start to take on a new shape. And they'll start to see that you have some life in you. Now, they're not going to believe the first few things you say to them. They're going to think, this might be a trick. I still think this person might be dead. But they do sort of look like the person that I saw in a picture on the wall that I heard used to work here. Build those relationships. After you say your short piece about being a human being, back away slowly again and wait for your next encounter to say a little more. Don't overdo it. You will start to become a real alive person in their eyes with these baby step interactions. But also, be prepared to get a knife in the head as well. You might want to start wearing a helmet around the office. Another thing is to try to convince the younger generations you don't have a gender. Because if they get a whiff that you have a gender, you are done. And you won't even know what you did wrong. You might innocently ask a younger generation person, hey, have you seen her? And they're like, who's her? And you'll say, the lady who works in marketing? That's it. You're done. And they've already job top and they're starting that afternoon. And it'd be better if you didn't have any genitalia either. So you're smooth down there. That way you can say, hey, I'm not only the president, I'm also smooth down here. So you can trust me. Now, that's a conversation you're going to have to have with your spouse, too. Now, they get to keep their genitalia, the younger generations, but you don't. That's the deal. And you can also motivate those younger employees, get them to relate to you by shaming people, specifically white men, older white men. Make sure it's a white man. Pick a random older white guy you don't mind losing and tell the younger employees in a moment, you know, between you two privately. <laughs> Look at this guy. You know what he did? He asked me to make more money than all the women in the company. What's wrong with him? You got to ruin one white man's life in order to relate to the younger generation in your company. But it's worth it because these are the people that are going to help you connect to your younger consumer base. And they won't tell you what the hashtags are until you shame some white man. And don't use Uber. All right. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. <laughs>